Hi, this is James Deaker. I am here with industry veteran Mike Petrella. Mike spent time previously, a long time at AOL, spent time at Yahoo. We're going to be talking some industry consolidation today and a number of other dynamics that have been going on recently. Mike, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Thanks very much, Mr. Deaker. It's a pleasure to see you and even better to be here. Excellent. Now, you and I were talking and, you know, obviously people have been talking industry consolidation for many years. Why do you believe that now the time is ripe for more industry consolidation than we've seen previously? I think we've foregone the honeymoon period post COVID. So COVID forced up the evolution of the industry uh, quite a bit where people couldn't be in person. Um, the idea of communicating virtually increased from both a personal and a business perspective. Entertainment changed from live to streaming or in home. Uh, and just, I guess, the need to, the need for both business and personal, personal communication online just uh, grew ex exponentially. We're now in a spot where the ecosystem in itself is fairly full across the board. We have folks going back to the office, folks going back out, and that that need to be at home and exclusively just work, talk, live at home is no longer there. So as a result, you know, it's not sustainable in the sense of that every single part of the ad tech industry has grown at the same rate. So when we think about the, some of the major parts of the ecosystem, obviously on one side, on the supply side, you've got the SSPs. On the demand side, you've got the DSPs. There continues to be many of both, although we're starting to see consolidation. Where, where does that play out? I was speaking with um, the CEO of one SSP, and he said something that resonated that DSPs are going to choose somewhere between two and four SSPs to move forward with in the future. And this person wanted their SSP to be um, to be a choice for that. I think it's true, right? There's a finite amount of demand. There is going to be challenges to target in the way that we have once the cookie is fully deprecated. Um, and quite frankly, like budgets have been a little slow out of the gates in 23, right? The recession that never happened is still having an effect. I think there's a number of world factors that not that haven't necessarily increased or improved. Um, and I think people are just being smarter and more picky with where their dollars are going. So you also have this, this crazy scenario where advertisers don't need publishers, but publishers need advertisers, right? And, and that's a very, very disheartening um, scenario, especially if you are a publisher and an SSP, because that's a source of your business. So now you have all these complicating factors and, and there just isn't room for everyone else. Right, there's the room for everybody, I should say. Um, I think access to audiences, access to direct supply, um, pristine tools to execute bias, to report, to provide transparency, safety, and all the other aspects that people are asking for. Those are going to be paramount in, su in the success of these companies. And those that fall behind from a product standpoint, those that fall behind um just in terms of complacency uh will suffer the consequences i don't think it's going to be a dire people are being you know cut off immediately i just think people are getting smarter and smarter with where their budgets are going and looking for partners who will build with them who will grow with them and, and really who can provide the best service possible well, of the publishers which are in good position and which are in poor position and, and what role does data play in that conversation Publishers that have first party data are in a great position, right? It is verified closed loop type reporting. I mean, you essentially provide everything that an audience, that an advertiser wants, if you can do it at scale. There's 30, 35 publishers that have more than, let's call it 20% verified or, um, you know, logged in traffic. And that's your Wall Street journals, Etsy, Pinterest, Facebook, you know, the walled gardens, if you will. Publishers that are solely reliant upon advertising revenue um, are are going to be challenged, right? I, I think that's going to be a problem. I think you saw when the cookie deprecation news first came out, you saw everyone try and think about a paywall, about retail media or e-commerce play, um, subscription models, I guess the same as paywall. 
so th there was there were questions about how do I subsidize the ad revenue and, and I really haven't seen um, I haven't seen anything that's really led the way so far however you know there's a lot of successful publishers out there right now uh, I'll give uh, the arena group a lot of credit watching with Andrew Kraft uh, and his team have done um, continue to innovate continue to show um, you know quarter over quarter revenue goals uh, results like there are people who are doing it and and I just don't know if that's a recipe that everyone can follow right that's the that's the challenge I think a lot of publishers have can you do can you lead the way so, so staying on the data theme and how publishers might use and how they think about identity, one of the uh, streams that might flow a little bit against some of the industry consolidation we talked about at the start is the fact that with the cookie going away, there perhaps is going to be, at least in the short term, more identity solutions rather than fewer. What are your thoughts on that? 25 companies trying to replace one cookie. Um, and I think the IP address is next. Not all 25 will win. Um, I think a subset will. I think players like Lotomy, players like Iris and other contextual based solutions will reap the benefits as well as budgets have to be spent and whether they can really grow based on the history of results they've provided are great. I think digital out of home will see a bit of a bump as well again the one to many um it's going to be a lot of test fail test fail test succeed right and it's going to be dependent upon which audiences you have which advertisers you have who they're targeting i don't think it, it, there's no silver bullet it's impossible right the cookie provided a significant amount of value in terms of what you can track first party audiences by far have more complete data but don't have as widespread a scope as the cookie did. And um, I think the interoperable piece is the very important piece. Give Trade Desk credit, uh, open internet, um, at least for UID 2.0, and, and really making that available to everyone. I think companies that are kind of closing those walls um, need to have an incredibly valuable offering and product to really win share of voice. I think the open internet is going to be the key uh, as people will both succeed and fail together. So you and I have both been in this industry a really long time, enough to remember when before audience targeting, contextual targeting was the key 15 years ago. And there's talk that with the fact that to some extent audience targeting is compromised, or maybe compromised in the next year or two, we're going to see the rise of contextual targeting. Uh, again, there are obviously going to be challenges associated with that, particularly around scale. But how do you think about the relative value of audience versus contextual targeting over the course of the next year or two? I think it will see a bump. Um, again, it's going to be an avenue that's that's not negatively impacted by the inability to target on an audience basis. Um, the question is sort of, what do you add on to contextual targeting to make it even more valuable, right? Um, I, I think Magnite was smart in terms of their acquisition of the DMP, whose name I can't remember, um, to be able to sort of supplement some of that contextual piece, uh, you know, with with that piece. Lotomy, the same thing. Lotomy has been the longest standing DMP in the uh, in the industry, and they continue to to innovate, to to enhance, and to evolve. Um, Iris is an interesting company uh, where they have really done a great job of getting um, just integration really into video to begin with and seeing that bump. So I like the idea of contextual growing as a need. It's whether or not the results that they produce will be as targeted and, you know, I guess lower funnel as, as what first party and audience targeting has been able to do in the past. Got it. Um, another industry trend we, we've got to discuss is the rise of retail media networks. Uh, this seems like it's not going away anytime soon. In fact, every company seems to be jumping in. How do you see it playing out? Will the, those who are jumping in get the value and payoff that they are obviously hoping for? Or do you see it being a little bit overhyped? 
I think the initial result is going to be positive where you have specific users you can target. You have data depending on who, right? So Amazon will have a significant amount of data where users come and interact daily. They'll understand purchase history, purchase intent, um, and be able to take that data. And they, they apply it to a larger spectrum, right? In terms of their, their ad tech ecosystem. I think the idea that everyone, every retailer has a retail media network creates fragmentation where you have one audience here, one audience there, one audience here, you know, in the sense retailer one, retailer two, retailer three. How do advertisers efficiently execute their budgets? And I think there's going to be a need to sort of bridge some of these media networks so you can look holistically across audiences. Um, clean rooms do some of that, right? Take party one, take party two, throw it in there, see who you have, see who you don't. Um, I think it remains to be seen. There, you know, Home Depot launched a launched a retail media network, right? Gap got out of it because they said it wasn't profitable. Like our industry, it's going to be just a lot of a lot of testing. I think there's going to be a lot of A/B testing as well. Which which network produces the best results? Which information is most helpful? Um, and then redundancy, right? Like if you have a Walgreens account, do you have a CVS account? And is that is that information useful to a retailer or is it not? I think too, it's it's what you do with it, right? On site, I'm purchasing, and if I'm coming where I'm coming in daily, and I'm just looking for the best deal, where I'm just brand agnostic, is that helpful? Or can I actually drive user behavior based on my ability to create that personal message or personal offering? I think a lot has to be done with that. And it's it's a matter of scale because again, this is more getting into the privacy part where I'm giving more of my information to someone in hopes of, you know, in hopes of what you and I know it's going to benefit us because we understand the industry. But um, a non ad tech person, there actually are non ad tech people in this world, um, may have qualms about how much information they share. So I think it's also an education aspect. How is, you know, do people understand the convenience of targeting versus the inconvenience of untargeted? Um, and I think there has to be some education that goes along with all these laws that are coming through. 22 states have a privacy law, right? And they're getting some press. More states will have it, there's nothing national. Like, what do we do to essentially educate the general population about what we do and why it's beneficial? I think that that's going to that's going to play a big part in the success of, of retail media networks as well. Got it. Uh, again, we've we've talked about consolidation that we expect to occur within ad tech. Another part of the ecosystem, though, that does not seem to be consolidating but rather expanding is on the streaming service side where you know we continue to see more and more streaming services launched are they all sustainable or is the ecosystem big enough for them all or at the end of the day do we start to see consolidation on that side as well we have glorified the cable subscription right when it comes down to it what i love about linear tv is i can go on any channel and see what i want for a low monthly cost of whatever i pay i still have linear tv um we were looking two nights ago for a movie and i couldn't watch it because it was on paramount plus and that's one of the streaming services we don't have you know we have a sum zero rule in our house if you want one you take another away and i think that's the problem right it's you 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 create these walled gardens of content and what are people's appetites to have nine different subscriptions? There was that one ad exchanger cartoon. I don't know if you saw it. Like it's a remote control and it's like yay long. And each button is a streaming service. Um, and you also like look at the earnings releases, right? Or look at the quarterly results from these public companies. And they're losing money hand over fist with a path to profitability in 25 and 26. Like, okay, really? You know, not to say that it's easy, but it's it's costly to to create content, to stream it, and to to pay your loyalties and residuals and all this other stuff. Like the AVOD piece and the the sort of AVOD, like the the half half that everyone's introducing, seems to be helping a little bit. But even Netflix's most recent releases weren't necessarily promising, right? They were better. Um, I I that's what I worry about. It, it's just. I'm not, if I can't watch a show because I don't subscribe, I'm not going to subscribe. 
you know, I got we would did Apple TV because I wanted to watch Ted Lasso, and I unsubscribed the minute the I, we, the binge watching was done. Right? It's it's just sort of like a it's almost entitlement. You know, I want it now, and I want it, and I'm gonna let it go. I mean, what are it's your thoughts? I'm curious, just, like. Yeah. I mean, yeah. for me, I ended up right now. I've got Peacock for no other reason than they're the only ones streaming the Rugby World Cup that's on right now. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't think yeah. I'd have Peacock. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think that's that's hard. And um, you know, fast channels may may provide some medium there if the if these streamers decide to really share their content or like what, what's happening with CBS now. The writer strike is occurring, right? So what's CBS doing? Viacom took um, Yellowstone off streaming and they're showing one new episode every week on linear TV. So that's a good repurposing of content, right? For And and most likely if you're watching it on linear TV, you may not have seen it on a streaming standpoint. You may be tr touching the older demographic. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming here, I could be wrong, but I don't know. I, I don't think that's sustainable um, fiscally or from a user behavior standpoint. Um, I think two people are getting out more. They're not home binge watching because they're stuck in their apartments and restaurants aren't closed and like all this other stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think it could, I just don't think it can, um, continue the way it is. It doesn't, it, it's not good for the user quite honestly. Okay. Uh, I know we're short on time today, so let me ask you one more question, which is an issue that I thought I had hoped would be solved 10 years ago and has not been solved in any way, which is measurement uh it continues to be every new format that gets added every new device that gets added all these privacy challenges it seems like measurement is actually getting harder rather than easier in the space uh what would you like to say about measurement i do not envy the role of those trying to figure it out um i think it's hard i i think bridging the gap between linear and streaming as in terms of measurement of users there has just proven to be a continued uh, uh, open question. I mean, there's every single week you see a panel of industry leaders discussing measurement, right? And it's and it's not because they're not intelligent people trying to come to a resolution, it's because that's it's that complex of an issue. Um, it bodes well for companies like, you know, Samba TV, for uh, uh, Simo Media and others who are trying to fix this. I don't think Tony Katzer is getting a lot of sleep at night, you know, at the IAB tech lab because trying to standardize this thing is just not easy. And that's then, then you think about like, take that onto mobile, you know, Apple's introduced enough complexity in terms of tracking users, tracking performance, tracking that piece. And if I'm watching streaming on my phone, I have no idea what's happening on my iPhone, right? Android's a little bit better of an avenue. Um, I, it goes back to the other piece, the IP addresses in question too. A lot of people will, will mask elements of that IP address to be able to keep that in, in the information close to the vest and use it for the direct sales forces. That doesn't bode well for third parties trying to come into those environments and execute. I think, you know, it, I get stuck on this one because a I had I'm not as into the weeds as other folks are, but I read the the industry trades daily, and I understand that advertisers are having a very difficult time in terms of comprehending results. Users are seeing the same ad over and over again on their streaming device, right? And that's not a good user experience. But I'm not going to spend money if I don't know what what's actually happening. Something there has to be some uniformity that comes along at some point or else, you know, 16 different measurement companies aren't going to work. Nielsen and, and Comscore seem to be, you know, Nielsen seems to be moving a little bit more um, in that direction. I was reading something today where they're not going to force Amazon data um, into certain in certain metrics too. So again, more fragmentation, but a bigger incomplete picture. Um, uh, the walled garden is a good and bad thing. Within the walled garden, it's very good for those who play with those and i'm not just pinning uh, amazon just in general um it makes for a difficult means of a, a fully functioning ecosystem because you have these minor microcosms and microsystems that sit within the greater ecosystem that don't provide as much value as the open aspect of it and i think that 
you know, as walled gardens grow, I think that that could be a challenge if there's not a willingness to sort of figure out a way to play nicely. Excellent. Thank you, Mike, for taking the time. Uh, to, to the user, to the viewer, if you're getting value out of this content, please hit the like and subscribe button. It really does help. And uh, we'll have other upcoming guests. Mike, again, thank you so much for taking the time today. I appreciate it, James. Thanks very much.